I'm Maria. Uh, I go by nutritionist Maria in the cyberspace world, but I am a nutritionist and a behavior specialist who helps people with a relationship with food, with a destructive relationship with food. So I sort of help people, anyone who has any sort of tension with food or destructive eating habits, I help them heal in a holistic way. And I'm really passionate about using new scientific findings and old spiritual teachings and combining them to help people heal from the root of the problem. Um, and to be released from the paradigm that they're currently trapped in. Well, Maria, I do greatly appreciate you being here. Super excited. Um, I mean, you just, you're just you an influential person in the, the space, and I love that you get to the heart and the root. So um, before we even really get started, uh, I, I want to know kind of some back history, some story about how you fell in love with nutrition, but also on the emotional side of the journey and kind of where those those met because so often you know myself it's like oh learn everything about nutrition and you'll have all the answers and then you learn a ton about nutrition and you realize you have almost zero answers uh, <laughs> from the behavioral psych standpoint of things uh, with actually yeah. implementing change so I want to know how it came to be for you yeah um I love that you said, how did you come to love nutrition? Because I actually do love nutrition now, but that's not how I started. I think I started more with the mindset of wanting to control mm. uh, and to know everything that I could know so that I could deal with specific problems that I was dealing with. Um, and it was less about loving food and loving nature and more about what I wanted and um, how I thought things ought to be and how I could control my diet in such a way that I could, to, could manifest what I wanted. Um, and then along that journey, I started to realize uh, that I love nature and I love food and that this whole journey was happening to me and this whole, all the struggles were happening to me for a reason. Um, and yeah, it's actually really interesting because a lot of what I do is being a voice for food um, and helping, obviously helping someone amend their relationship with food is helping them see food in a different way. And I think, you know, culturally, yeah. we have a real issue with the way that we see food uh, currently, I think. Um, so yeah, so it was kind of more of a journey of like, First it was control and then it was surrender and then it was love. And then it just, yeah. Classic, uh, hero's journey here, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> I I'm, guess so. Yeah. I'm curious not to take it too far down this rabbit hole, but you said controlling food. Was that really what you were trying to control or was that what was at the surface and there was something else you were trying to control or manipulate? Um, that's a really great question. I'm just trying to make sure I answer it honestly. Um, I, th I think, uh, yeah, well, I think a little bit of both, you know, definitely on the surface, it was, um, wanting to control my diet and to be as, as healthy as possible so that I could be as vibrant as possible so that I could be as superhuman as possible so that I could be confident so that I could, you know, so yeah. Yeah. Like obviously, and just like everyone's relationship with food, there's all these layers, right? And everyone's always yeah. looking at the top layer and it's like, well, why do I, why am I, you know, stuck in these behavior, behavioral patterns? But of course there's always all of these layers underneath there. So, um, that's actually a really good question. Um, and yeah, there was definitely a lot under there. Definitely. Yeah. 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 So it was coming from a positive place of like wanting to ultimately be as healthy as possible, but it was probably also, feeding the ego so to speak to present to the world like as the best version of you yeah i guess so you know like um the way that my relationship with food took a drastic turn for the worse was because i obviously at some point didn't think i was good enough as i was that i had to yeah. have such control over something and i i somewhere down the line downloaded the belief that if I only was as vibrant and healthy as possible, then that would be the solution to all of these problems, I guess. Um, and then, you know, obviously around that, along that journey, I realized like, okay, that, that is just some false idea that I downloaded and there was, you know, tons of work to do under, 
with that as well. So yeah, <laughs> great question. I yeah. don't think you could, you could probably do what I do. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, I, I just thought it was interesting that you were talking about that. And so often, and I know like, you know, with, with certain clients and stuff like that, where it's, this building of I'll be happy when, you know, mm-hmm. this, then this cause yeah. and effect. And it's not, you're taking yourself into that new job. You're taking yourself into that new relationship. You're also taking yourself into that new body, even if it is a few pounds lighter. And so it's not this, like, I'm going to be happy here. So it just, it struck me that self-esteem aspect is probably so, so critical um, yeah, it's not very common knowledge that there is, we have a, an emotional set point. So the hmm. way that we, the emotions that we practice the most over the course of our lives actually start to become background noise and we don't even realize that they're there anymore and they are just part of the emotional set point. And not only do our thoughts drive our emotions, but our emotions then also drive our thoughts, which then gets us stuck in this habitual loop. And you know, if it influences what we end up seeing, how we end up behaving with other people, how people react to us, so it all just becomes you know self fulfilling prophecies and just you know a downward spiral in that direction. But you don't even realize that the emotions are there because they've been there for as long as you can remember, right? And so, um, yeah, I, it's I think. Um, a lot of the times with when it comes to an unhealthy relationship with food, people don't realize what the problem is because the problem has been there for so long. Yeah. 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 That emotional set point piece. Like that's why I just was like my face drastically changed. Cause I mean, we know that there's, you know, set points for where the body likes to hold on and, and just live in homeostasis with weight and, and whatnot. But I've never heard it from an emotional mm. kind of IQ um, standpoint. That's, uh, yeah. that, was, that was absolutely brilliant. Um, and By the time you reach 35, everything is basically that everything that you're thinking, everything that you're doing, everything that you're feeling, you know, it's all just part of the body's circadian rhythm. Yeah. It's all downloaded programs and your emotional state is, is part of that one of those programs. And it, people might say, well, no, sometimes I'm happy and sometimes I'm sad and sometimes I'm it, it, it's part of your circadian rhythm when you know what triggers that what you know that state of being what time triggers that you know it's all it's all just a cycle though um not so much when we're young and we're downloading these programs but if we aren't aware and uh we aren't staying awake and mindful of who we are and what we're becoming then by the time yeah we reach 35 it's all an automatic program and so what happens is a lot of the times people are blaming the outside world. It's like, this made me mad. That made me mad. This made me mad. It's like, no, actually you have stored anger. And the first thing that you see is through the lens of anger, through the lens of judgment, through the lens of criticism. And I mean, that's just one of many emotions. It could be sure. guilt or shame or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and so, yeah, part of my work actually is addressing emotional addictions. Yeah. So it's like the, the adapted phase where you're adapting to everything that is coming in as you're shaping your beliefs and having, you know, thoughts, the language of the brain with feelings or emotions, the language of the body. Yeah. Um, and then there's the adopted phase past 35, where you're no longer adapting, you're just adopted into those 80,000 pre-programmed daily thoughts on a yeah. habitual basis. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 So then, so then, I mean, most of my listeners, um, almost, you know, wide spectrum, but the majority are between the age of 35 and 55 females and, mm. you know, striving to heal the relationship with food, lose weight, break these cycles of hiding food. Um, you know, that's a, that's a common thing. And, uh, and of course, stress eating, which we talk a lot about on here. And so for them who's listening, um, I'm sure a lot of people are going, <laughs> Great. Thanks, Maria. I'm over 35 and I'm stuck. So no, well, you're not. I mean, you're not, you're not stuck if you're willing to do the work, but most people aren't even aware that they are now operating from, from patterns. They actually think that what's happening on the outside is affecting the inside, which is to a certain degree, but what's happening on the inside is also affecting on, on the outside as well. And so, uh, once you know you become aware and you have insight to your patterns and i mean you can't figure out all your patterns at once you know healing is is, is a journey but once you're aware and you have some insight to your patterns you can say okay well is that one serving me anymore is it not and with 
mindfulness and some persistence and knowing the right tools, you absolutely can change any of your automatic programs that are causing you to end up in the same paradigm over and over again. Um, but sometimes it can be a little bit hard to identify them on your own because the dialogue in your mind or the voice inside your mind that you think is you but is not actually you for the most part are these habitual thoughts from the subconscious mind that is actually sustaining the paradigm that is programmed to sustain and yeah. so it's convincing you very very well but why you should continue doing things the way that you are and it it will always feel you know really um awkward to, to do things differently and it's also hard to see um, so that is something that I'm really well trained in and in, in, within a couple of sessions, I'm able to sort of see how someone is stuck in the paradigm that they're stuck in. And then I'm able to reflect that back to them. And then of course, use specific tools to reprogram them on a subconscious level so that they're able to actually sustain the new programs or the new routines and habits. Yeah. So, that, that makes yeah. sense. I almost picture like, you know, it's like a horse with blinders on and it doesn't know if it's in a small room or a giant room or an open field to that degree. Mm. And, uh, and you're just giving enough insight and awareness. Um, and awareness is something that every guest, every person who's come on here, you know, be it an expert or, you know, someone who's gone through a transformational journey and lost, you know, 40, 50, or even a hundred plus pounds, um, mm. has shared that it was awareness of habits, patterns, and, the unconscious beliefs that were guiding them without being again aware. So that, uh, that resonates deep for sure. So, mm -hmm. you know, someone who's listening is going, well, I, I got to start gaining some awareness. I'm aware that what I'm doing isn't serving me. Where do they start? Um, well, actually I, I would, w with that, if someone said that specific sentence to me, I would say, well, no, actually go back and, and, start with the awareness that what you're doing is serving you mm. and how is it serving you? What are the, what is the payoff? What is the reward? What are you getting? Because that's part of the uh, body's recorded or the subconscious recorded way of getting particular needs that universal needs met that that must be be met. And if you don't realize what food or your habits or your whatever it is that you're doing, what the ultimate goal is, then you're never going to have enough insight to think, okay, well, what else can I do to replace? Like, what can I replace it to get that same goal? Yeah. Because once, you know, you basically, a craving is basically just something in the environment has cued a particular craving and then you do a particular routine that gets you a, a reward. Okay. So the craving is for this reward, but the craving will not subside if you don't, if you don't get the reward. So one of the big issues is people are trying to use willpower in order to, you know, maintain their conscious mind's goals. And it's like, well, willpower has got a limit, first of all. And yeah. second of all, like you never address the, the actual craving and the, the thing that you actually need. And so eventually willpower will fatigue them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. He Heb's law, right? Or Heb's law? Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's been around forever. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. yeah. I'm not even really sure if it originates from him, but yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's super helpful. So obviously then, you know, addressing the environment and I think environment plays a, a, probably a huge role for most people. Um, mm. What's uh, what are kind of your go-to tips and suggestions for helping someone create a better environment for them? You know, cause so often people have a spouse or work environment where it's not going to be supportive um, to, to the degree that they want and go. So how crucial is environment and how do you start to shape your environment? Cause you talked about the lens and what we bring forth and I just so spot on. And so I'm sure the two correlate in some way and I, yeah, I let mean, you dig. I mean, you asked, you just asked me like, 20 questions. I know. I'm like, um, you're making my brain go like 30 directions. I wasn't <laughs> Yeah, you just asked like, me I so many know this things. And this and and I was this. like, oh, I could go so many directions with this. I know. Um, we have to do a second know, episode. We, we have this sort of false idea that we are separate from our environment and our environment doesn't actually have any impact on us. And you just, you, we are part of the whole. All is one. So it's in the same way that a cell in your body is you know, its own cell, but it part, it works as part of a unified system and the rest of the environment will affect the integrity of the cell. 
So we're the same way, you know, we're part of the whole. So nothing is separate from anything. Everything is interconnected and has an impact on you. And so even, even my words and listening to my words will, if they, uh, resonate with you will become part of your neurological wiring and might change the lens in which you see things for the rest of your life. So I've now become a part of you. So what you're willing to allow through your senses, through your eyes, through your ears, you know, all your senses is part of your diet. It's, it's part of your way of life. And so we think diet is food and drink, but it's not. Diet originally means way of life. It's everything that we ingest from the world that actually becomes a part of us and has influence on us. That is such a positive way to use the word diet. It's your way of life. It is more than food. Like that makes me actually really like the word diet right there. That is, that is so good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. And everything that comes into the, to your senses, like basically has a, a effect on you. And um, I think in a lot of cases, people who, feel that they're in a toxic environment, what is actually happening is a boundary issue, is that they um, are not able to, to identify when they have had enough, whether yeah. that be with food, whether that be with abuse, whether that be with negative energy or you know, any of these kinds of things, um, or their unwillingness to set boundaries because they don't, be they believe that, uh, you know, someone will leave them and they don't, they don't believe that they can be on their own or, you know, like insecurities about what they'll do without these toxic relationships or career or whatever it is. So it's, it's, I think the first thing I would say to someone who's really, feeling that the environment that they're in is actually not a healthy environment with it for them. It doesn't actually resonate with them. They know it's, it's dark, heavy energy is find out what is at the root of them being unwilling to set healthy boundaries. Hmm. So in some cases, the boundaries are too rigid and they don't let anyone in and they're lonely. So it's, it's a, moderation of you know learning how to say no when things are not the way that you envision your life and when you know they feel toxic and also you we also have to acknowledge feelings which is a whole other thing yeah um you know just but but the willingness to set boundaries the willingness just to have the mindset that i am i am here I am real, you know, my space matters, what I manifest in this world matters, you know, I have power, I have choice, the, all of these sort of things. And a lot of people are, especially right now in the type, the type of world that we live in, boundaries are a big, big, big issue. Yeah. yeah, it's almost, what I'm almost hearing from it is that, you know, from the aspect of diets and the aspect of boundaries, it's really a conversation of like tolerance and standards and almost the set point of, you know, if you have high standards for yourself, then you actually have low tolerance for things that aren't beneficial for you and your world and your life, as opposed to kind of this opposite where we think, you know, we need to, you know, be able to stand strong, to endure, to like suffer through the pain. And that's almost like celebrated in these days mm. in this day and, age, and to be able to grit through. And it's almost that willpower conversation. Um, but you set no standards for yourself. Your, your standards are really low for that. And therefore the boundaries go out the window. And then I'm assuming that's where blame or shame come into play, whether it's external or internal. Yeah. So it's really hard for me to answer any one of these questions in like a really clear, succinct way. But, yeah. <laughs> but, but just the last question, because it's like, well, yes, and now we're talking about boundaries. But then at the same time, it's what's really important for people to understand is that everything that is currently in your life at, at, the, at this point in time or at any point in time is in your life for a particular reason. And you are magnetically attracted to that vibration because of your vibration and your vibration is a result of how you think and you feel. And that creates an electromagnetic field around you, which actually makes you drawn to certain things and, and not drawn to certain things. And so sometimes we can identify that something makes us feel bad, but it's actually our vibration that's attracted to that thing over and over again. Sometimes we'll be in a relationship and we know that the relationship is completely toxic and we keep trying to push that person away. And then we're just like more magnetically attracted to them. 
And it's because that person actually, they, those two are actually magnetically bonded to each other to sustain a particular paradigm, to sustain a particular vibration. And so one, it's like having that mindful awareness of like, okay, this is a boundary for me. I don't want this energy in my life anymore. But what about me is magnetically attracted to that vibration as well? That's also important to, to know as well. So this is why I say like, you know, it's kind of hard to do the work by yourself. Totally. You, it, you don't always see it this, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And you said that we are, no, we're, yeah, we're attracting to it or it's attracting to us both. or both? Both. Okay. Yeah. 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 And then it just continues and it's almost like we're addicted to it. So it's because it's ingrained in us going back to that 35 year type, uh, yeah, exactly. So, you know, it doesn't matter what our relationship, whether it's with food, with another person, basically that relationship is only the way that it is because of the combination of who I am and that thing, right? And so this is why you always see a victim with an oppressor, right? Right. You, right. I mean, you wouldn't see me with an oppressor because it just doesn't, this is something I'm not attracted to it's like what no you know right right you're not vibrating that yeah you know but if you're a different vibration then you might actually be attracted to that person and a lot of times I hear when I'm like trying to explain this to people they go well no I didn't know he was like that in the beginning and it's like consciously you didn't consciously conscious mind (laughs) knows your subconscious mind knows everything you know it's connected to the whole right and so this is this is how two things come together it depends on the vibration yeah and so it's just bringing that awareness to to the conscious mind and trying to wake it up and uh you know and why am i keep attracting the same thing and even though i know that i don't want this anymore even though this is not something that i that i believe should be part of my standards why is it you know that's really important to know so on the same front, then we're attracting those same struggles with food or those emotional patterns with food and, and all of those things. Um, so like, what do you feel is kind of the biggest struggle that you see and you help people with more than anything else when it, when it comes to food, diet, weight, and all that? Well, I live in my own little paradigm, right? Um, and so I often do see a lot of the same problems over and over again, especially that are pe- really prevalent now. Um, but when it comes to really if you really think about it, when it comes to any disorder, the problem usually stems from excess rigidity or chaos. And then when we have a dysfunction, it's like we're bouncing between the two. And usually one breeds the other because when you swing a pendulum in one direction, it has to swing to the opposite end to the same degree. Um, So I think something that's really prevalent right now is binging. Um, Uh, and and going from ex- excessive rigidity, which is basically the root of binging, and yeah. keep, you know, and it takes me so long sometimes to get through to someone when I'm trying to explain that they're like, no, 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 I just binge, and it's like, no, there's no way you binge without excessive rigidity, and they, they don't even see that that what they're doing is causing the binging. They think that their excessive rigidity is after the binging does that make sense they think oh no but i'm actually making up for all this binging i did and it's like no you're binging because you're not eating enough for what's going on with you neurologically and biochemically yeah and your body's revolt and saying it's your body's revolt and so what can be really confusing for someone is they'll be like well hold on i'm like 30 pounds you know over what i'm supposed to be And it's like, no, well, your body has a weight set point. So if your brain has increased your weight set point and increased hunger and decreased feelings of satiety, there is a root cause for that. So putting someone on a diet is like putting someone, let's say someone has asthma and you give them breathwork techniques. It's like, well, that might momentarily do something maybe. Sure. But what's happening is not a conscious something that you need to control consciously there's an unconscious something going on in the unconscious mind in the body so wouldn't you want to get to the root cause of what's happening and why this, you have asthma or you're having an asthma attack you know so it's the same thing it's like well why has your body and there's several reasons why it might be that your brain has increased your weight set point now if you start to 
control your diet and, and, and do you believe in the calories in, calories out model or the macronutrient you know, ideas and all this ridiculous ideas that have been long since disproven and you start to control and, to, and, and, and have less and restrict, well, the body and the root cause has never been addressed. Well, the body will just make even more modifications, making you even hungrier, reducing um, satiation even more and increasing the weight set point. So it's actually dieting itself and the rigidity that is actually causing most of the problem that I'm seeing now. Um, so trying to get through to people about that is, is, is hard, but <laughs> um, yeah, once they understand that and we bring the pendulum back into balance, um, that's when most people have a really big leap in their healing. That's really, really cool. Yeah. A pendulum analogy, like completely makes sense. Mm. Um, you know, so we go too far one way and it's again, kind of like your original piece where it was like, it was with good intention to achieve a positive place and, and to feel confident and probably be in a good space for most of the people within this, but then it swings too far. And so therefore they're yeah, trying to it, unconsciously balance. The really interesting thing is um, there's different types of, uh, constitutions that have different, uh, not only characteristics in the body, but also characteristics in the mind. And the type of person who is attracted to a job of like, you know, a nutritionist or, a, um, you know, a health and wellness guru, or even a teacher or a scientist, or all of these different things tends to be a particular type of constitution. And that particular type of constitution also has a tendency to have the mind frame or the the state of mind of if a little of something is good then a lot must be the way sure and so a lot of the issues that we are having right now i think when it comes to health the health and wellness field and stuff like that is that we're not considering that the, some of the people that are teaching including myself you know something i have to be mindful of uh, lean towards this kind of mindset and they're just people too. And just because something works sometimes doesn't mean it works all of the time. And the really interesting thing when it comes to life in general is that anything that is true in one instance could a moment in time or one little factor can change the picture just enough that that is no, no longer true anymore. Yeah. And so I think one of the most empowering things people can do is stop looking for all of the answers on the outside and start reconnecting with the body. And it's like, does this actually feel right for me? Yeah. You know, leaps and bounds of healing what can be done when you start looking inward. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's so good. I mean, you're, you're spot on. I mean, we were wrong about fats kind of first, right? If we're looking at it from the scientific standpoint, right? It was this big thing of like, you know, low fat, no saturated fat, like nothing, right? And a lot of science came out at, you know, saying we're wrong about this. We need some of these healthy fats for our brain. This needs to be done differently. And it was like, we were wrong completely about carbs. And now we're kind of in this weird phase where I'm just waiting for the nutrition industry to bust and be like, oh, wait, new research, we're wrong about proteins. But then it's like, Going further yeah, and going, yeah. well, maybe we're wrong about all of it and we just need to be in tune with what does full feel like? What yeah. does this fuel like in my body or, you know? We were semi wrong about okay. fat. We were okay. semi wrong about carbohydrates. We sure. were semi wrong, you know, and we are probably, semi, we are semi wrong about proteins and we're semi wrong about everything because everything has a time where it's good in a time where it's not good. And in, in nature, everything can either be a nutritive tonic or it can be a harmful substance. And it actually depends on what's happening in that particular being at that particular point in time. And mm. so there's a reason why when they do studies to prove that it's fats or it's carbohydrates or it's proteins, that they can do studies where they are able to find some validity in that argument but then at the same time there'll be completely other another study that's, that not only says that that is wrong but also that that advice is harmful because right. sometimes this is true and sometimes this is true and so 
when you notice, when you go in a cycle in a year, you'll notice that, okay, nature gives us more carbohydrate foods and lots of fruits are, you know, are abundant at that time. And we're really hot and the environment is hot and these cooling fruits cool us down. And then, you know, we go into winter and we have to have more fats and these kinds of things. And that really helps us with the mucus in our, in our uh, gut lining. And then in the springtime, we get all these cleansing foods and where do we actually do do a lot of cleansing and the body is is happy to cleanse at that time and so it doesn't it's not necessarily is it fats is it proteins is it carbohydrates right. they all have a place they're macronutrients right but you can you can eat too much kale you could eat it you could have too much anything and you can have not enough, enough of anything yeah dangers in the dose yeah 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 no that's cool and i, I love the tie to um just understanding from what nature is trying to do for us environmentally and cue us into uh, if we're willing to be aware. So yeah, so we're trying to like understand and dissect and control something that's so astronom astronomically more intelligent than us. And it's, it's actually ridiculous. And we are not really remembering to stay humble as we're trying to understand this thing that we can't even fathom what it is that we're understanding and like our brains are just way too young to be able to to comprehend it and i think it's the lack of humility and a lack of remembering that that there is this intelligence that's much larger than us and and i i think it actually stems a little bit from shame and and low self-worth is that we can't admit that we don't know so the, the so the leaders are like that and then the people that are following are also kind of low self-worth or shame where they're like they they let an outside source become their authority and they just give up all of their um personal power to what who, you know whoever's teaching them about health and wellness or whoever, whoever's the latest guru right <laughs> yeah and there is a wisdom within all of us that is connected to the whole that is much smarter than any person, nutritionist or any health guru or, or any scientist really. Um, and that wisdom has evolved over billions of years and it controls hunger and satiation. Hmm. So trying to do, control that consciously is ridiculous. It's just like, that's not what you, your conscious capacity is for. You know, your, the, the primitive part of your brain that's evolved over billions of years ha is controlling that and you're not going to win if you try and go against it. So you can look at yourself and see like why, what's happening within my being that is making me overeat, that, that is a possibility, but actually trying to control by denying yourself these kinds of things, you're not going to win. You will, yeah. you will, it will power will fatigue and the, um, the, uh, survival instincts will override and you will binge. Yeah. yeah. So it's a, it's a surrendering and a letting go. Um, but also an acknowledgement of patterns and behaviors and it's trying to get to the root of the cue that is causing the behavior. Yeah. I mean, it, that is one of the first steps to have some insight, but it's not just, it's not just our cravings and the cues in the environment. It's, it's actual hunger and satiation at your actual weight set point, which can be influenced by a variety of factors. It can be influenced by the quality of food that you've had over the course of your life. It can be in uh, influenced by your perceived level of scarcity, you know, if, whether you believe that you're beta or alpha, you can be um, influenced by your chronic stress levels, you, you know, by all sorts of things, you know, yeah. and whether you believe that you're powerful, lovable, all of these things actually affect your appetite and people don't realize that they do because everything is connected, right? Yeah. Um, and so first step is really identifying cues and having some insight towards that, but actually really having to really be break free from the paradigm of constantly monitoring what you eat and having to like control that all is to find out why subconsciously your body is storing more than you actually need. Hmm. Yeah. That's, that's why they need a coach. They need a, a guide <laughs> to go on the journey. For sure, so, um. Yeah. I think it's important. I mean, you, I think, yeah, I mean, I did it on my own, so it's obviously possible, but you know, that was like a 20, 
some odd year process. And, <laughs> yeah, I don't recommend doing it that way. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can do anything on our yeah, own, but we sometimes we can get a lot further and even faster yeah. if we, yeah. you know. Yeah, I would yeah. have loved to have someone who knew what I knew, no, now back then, but you know, I there wasn't anyone, and it was because there wasn't. You see, I'm actually, and we're speaking about a problem that didn't exist so much twenty, you know, a hundred years ago or fifty years ago. So what I do now is something that I had to kind of invent because there wasn't a solution to the problem before. Yeah. I mean, that's where your book came from is because there wasn't one on it. (laughs) It's not like you set out and were like, I'm going to write a book um, someday. It was like, I can't find the book that I need. So I'm going to compile everything possible, test on myself and then write a book about it. Yeah, that's exactly what (laughs) happened. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. I was like, where's this book? And it's like, oh, okay, well, I guess I'll have to write it then. Yeah. Yeah. So we, I mean, just because we segued there, um, please share. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's called The Eating Enigma. And it's all really about um, emotional eating, food addictions, and a lot about, you know, what the cravings are about and how to use some tools to pacify those cravings. I don't get super into like all of the underlying root causes of why someone's hunger and satiation may be a little bit uh off or why their weight set point may be high. I do touch on it a little bit, um, but it's a really great place to start for anyone who is trying to find insight on, you know, why they're not able to lose some weight or, you know, hit their fitness goals or actually really any goals, any, any behaviors that you're like, okay, why am I doing this? And what can I do to, 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 get out of this paradigm to, you know, increase my chances of success. So basically is what the book is about. Um, and it, yeah, it's just available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Cool. Yeah. We'll link it up in the, in the show notes for yeah. people for sure. So super awesome. Um, I do kind of want to know what, what do people need to elicit lasting change? I know you've kind of touched on it in pieces, but I feel like it's a question that needs to stand alone. Um, uh, you know, it's such, it sounds like such a cliche response, but love. Yeah, I think love for themselves, um, love in their life, love for their body, love for everything that they do, their past and integration, you know, because we are single entities, but we aren't, we don't have single drives like it's not like i maria have one goal in life and that's the only goal that matters and you know i have all these drives and some of them will not really anymore in my case because obviously i'm aware of this but in in many people's lives these drives actually the programs that we've downloaded over the course of our lives in order to to satisfy that drive or to satisfy those desires Some of them compete with each other, which is starts to cause a lot of inner turmoil in people's lives. And people think, oh yeah, I'm a self-sabotager. It's like, there's no such thing as a self-sabotager. Why would anyone sabotage yourself? It's actually- And then you're you're creating that label, which you're just buying into. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very careful about, you know, the words that we use about like what we think that we're doing, but um, you're, it's actually self-preservation. So- there's this one part of you that wants this particular goal and another part of you that does this other thing because it needs this other goal. But it's like there are other programs or systems or habitual behaviors that can meet the needs of both those parts of you. And do you love yourself and that part of you enough? And do you accept that part of you enough in order to do the work to make sure that both parts are satiated because like you know there may be that one part of you that puts a really high value on how you look and how you you know you, how desirable you are to other people and all of these different things but then there's this other part of you that needs nutrition and you know does that make sense but yeah sometimes because of something that happened in the past and avoid in the past th- this part is be, to, to a toxic degree gets the energy and is willing to do very questionable things that affect the entire rest of the system. 
Interesting. Right. So I think when you love yourself and all the different parts of you and all the different parts of your life and all the trauma that you went through and, and, and you have integration of all of these different things, then you yourself can sort of kind of holistically come together and be more whole and there will be less, um, you know, inner, inner turmoil and less what appears as self-sabotage, but actually is not self-sabotage at all. Yeah. 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 It's, so, I mean, the self-preservation thing completely makes sense when we're thinking, mm. thinking it's self-sabotage. I mean, from everything uh, on a very simplistic level that I've understood is the brain's main two jobs are one to conserve energy and two to keep you alive and safe. And if whatever you're doing is still keeping you alive and safe, even if it's smoking every single day and it's not, not serving you in the long run, if it's keeping you alive now, it's going to buy into that pattern. No, it, mu it must serve you. Yeah. It must serve you. Yeah. I mean, you, for the brain to adopt a habit, it, it has, there's a reward. There is, there is a, a need for that substance. And some people might yeah. say, smoking, like, what is that? Well, it, it could be anything. It could right. be, it could be from something going on in the third chakra where, you know, there's trapped energy and you and need to hold back and that, that, that energetic holding back because someone told you when you're a little kid to keep a secret to yourself and you're holding a secret, you know, your whole life and that's stuck and that's why you're smoking and you're attracted to that vibration you, or, or a number of things, you know, maybe yeah. you were taught that you were a good girl because you never complain. And so instead of expressing your emotions, you hold back and, you know, and, and that's something that you, you've attracted because of that. And it could, it could be really anything, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, everything does, does have a purpose, but although it can get to a point where the drawbacks outweigh the benefits, but right. if right. there's been no other means of resolving that issue where getting that core need met, um, then that will be the only program that the self knows how to preserve. Yeah. And yeah. so that's why you were saying like you get to the root and you get to the root mm -hmm. and then you can have awareness of it. If you have awareness, awareness precedes change and then change can actually start to unfold if you're meeting it with love. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the insight is, is useless without action. So you do, you do have to do the work and the work is hard and it, it, it it can be painstaking and some people don't want to do that and some people don't want to go inward, but you know, eventually you'll have to, yeah. you know, um, because whatever it is that you're using to pacify or to cover it up will eventually prove to have uh, consequences. And in the end you will have to look at it all. Um, but yeah. 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 And I, I think that's, that's spot on. Uh, the work is painful in most don't want to do it. And that's why we have so many different sedation techniques and things happening these days. And that's probably where food is one of them for, mm -hmm. for a lot of people. For some people. Yeah. 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 Very yeah. cool. Very cool. Well, um, where can people find you? Cause I know they're going to want to follow you cause you drop such good stuff and uh, especially on like just the pieces that no one else is really talking about in this regard. I mean, we have, you know, uh, tons of amazing people out there sharing this, but not really in regards to the nutrition and health and that type of space, um, mm. especially with energy stuff. I mean, one of my go-to things, not to get on a side note tangent, but, you know, clients always, uh, always get a little annoyed with me when they, you know, they come and I'm like, all right, cool. I want you to go meditate and then come back to me and tell me where you're at. <laughs> and that's one of the go-to techniques. And then it's always a totally different conversation afterwards because we can yeah. get somewhere with it. So yeah. just the fact that you're talking about a lot of these pieces was, was really cool. Um, mm. But Taking it back, where can people find you and follow you? Um, well, yeah. So in the cyberspace world, I go by nutritionist Maria. So every, uh, everything, pretty much my website, uh, you know, uh, Instagram, Facebook, it's all social. Uh, it's all nutritionist Maria, except for Twitter, which is nutritionist Mia because they couldn't fit it. Um, <laughs> and, and yeah, uh, I'm most active on Instagram. So yeah, if you like what you hear, follow me there, send me a message. I'm pretty interactive. So yeah. Love yeah. You. And I definitely agree. Everyone should follow uh, definitely on Instagram. Um, social media is one of these things where it can get a negative rap or a positive rap based on going to our previous conversation, your perception of it and what you're inviting and allowing in. Um, I did a gut um, a while ago and was just like, Instagram wasn't serving me. Facebook's not serving me. And, it's, and, and cut those, those pieces and was like, oh man, it really is what I was <laughs> vibrating out and attracting in. And all of a sudden, like, it just became such a positive light and mm. positive connections came right. And the right people, like all of a sudden, like things were coming in. That's how I found you a while ago, followed for a while. And it's like, yep, the message is spot on. Listeners need to expand and hear upon this. Um, you know? And so, uh, 
So I'm yeah, hoping that I feel the same way about social media. Whenever people say, Oh, you know, social media this, social media that, it's like, well, yeah, if you allow your social media to be like that, it's the same, it's the same as anything else in your environment. You know, I don't feel that way at all about my social media because I don't allow things that don't make me feel good. You know, it's like the second I see something that's just like not a good vibration, I just delete and gone. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but, but I'm very, very mindful and also have seen the transformation that's happened in my life from being conscious of what I allow in, you know? And so it's been a process for me to get to a place where I'm like the minute something is just not, I, I don't want to be exposed to that then, you know, uh, but I'm, you know, quite like, no, so I don't even have TV or watch the news or any of that. People are always like, what? You don't have, you don't know what's going on in the news. I'm like, if you were in nature, right. At what point would you ever be able to hear all the disasters that are happening across the entire globe? Like we're not meant to be bombarded with that much negativity. Yeah. You know, you're not hearing all of the miracles that are happening all the way across the world. So, you know, it's just like, it's just way too much. Um, so yeah, I, I feel the same way about social media when people are like, Oh, social media, this, that it's like, no, well you make your social media, what you make your social media, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I love the nature analogy. It's spot on. I was uh, climbing Mount Rainier uh, about a year ago and there was like a little rock avalanche that was starting to happen. And it was, we we're climbing at night, of course. And so you can't see where this is happening. And so true fight or flight type thing, but you're, you're, you're actually freeze, right? Cause you're like, ah, don't move, look and try and find where these rocks are falling and see if I'm going to get ripped off the mountain or, wow. crushed or whatever the case may be. Right. And um, and, and then it, you know, it passes and we're like, all right, onward. And then you're back to just being absorbed into the beauty of the moment and the mountains and everything. And it's, so it's kind of like, that's how it would be ideal to have news in this small dose of like, no, this is something you should actually pay attention to. This is where you actually need to fight, flight or freeze. Mm. Okay, now go back to the serenity and the beauty of everything else that is happening around us in life. And yet- yeah when we're not and we're getting bombarded with that, it's literally like an avalanche happening all the time. Uh, so that's why I love, love yeah, and it's, it, it's really interesting. It's like if you're living in a developed country and you're living in one of the most safest times in the history, like we live in ways, even someone who's not even that, uh, you know, doesn't believe that they're that affluent is living better than Kings and Queens could have ever imagined in other points. Yeah. Know? So it's it's ridiculous how fearful and how anxious we are considering how safe and secure we are right i and, I, I don't know if it's ridiculous though because first uh, we don't know any better at some degree because we haven't been taught that there is better than what we've had programmed right like we need conversations like these to kind of expose that show us that and then go on that journey of someone to be like no we're yeah well we're Yes. Okay. So if you're, if you've always, you know, lived in a city and had all the stimulation around you and been exposed to all of the things that you are normally exposed to, then yeah, you, you don't really know anything different. So yes, that's absolutely true. But so if you think about if everything that basically you think and do and feel is is um a cue sort of initiates that and sort of triggers a response and then you know you do this routine well the more stimulation you have around you uh the more cues you have around you yeah correct so yeah. the less in charge you are of your emotional state you're basically like being triggered by this thing that by that thing by this thing by that thing and so yes you know there you do need some awareness and someone to bring that away yeah. it's like actually, otherwise you are the, the victim the oppressor situation but with stimulation yeah absolutely absolutely and so i think you know that knowing that is really crucial um but yeah i, I yeah I, I do think that that's that's really crucial yeah yeah. I was going to go on to something else and make it a, bit, a little bit complicated, but I probably, I won't go there. Yeah. No, it's good. It's good. Yeah. It started out where, where it needed to go and continue to where it needed to go even further. Um, but to, to bring it back, like, you know, talking about it, just how social media can be a positive place and inspirational place and, and still an educational platform. I do want people to follow you there because of what you do put out. So, um, you know, I can't uh, influence anybody to, to do anything um, other than what's their own accord, but I definitely think that they, they should. So much appreciated for that. Um, so, you know, now we know where to find you. Um, definitely recommend the book for sure. 
and uh, I'll link up, you know, website and everything. Um, but kind of circling and ending up, what do you believe is, is what it takes to truly transform kind of summing it all up? Uh, to truly transform, uh, I think a definite decision, right? So if the, if there is a, if you are trying for something, then you haven't made a definite decision. Right. You don't try to get up in the morning and try to go to work and try to brush your teeth. Like these are all things that you do. They are part of the, the, that, that is how it is. Um, and so when you're trying to make transformation to your life, it's always going to be a little bit hard because you're not going against what's the normal routine, the normal uh, against the grain. And so I think one of the most important things is like failure is not an option that, that no matter how I feel, no matter how I, uh, what old thought patterns come up, um, I'm going to keep saying to myself that this, this is the way, this is the, this is what I accept for myself. And this is what I do not accept for myself anymore. Um, and I think one thing that's really important for people to understand that is, like I said earlier, is that in order for the brain to adopt a habit, there needs to be a reward. It needs to feel good. There needs to be a benefit. So if you decide, okay, you know, I'm going to start going to the gym every Monday morning, I'm going to get up and go to the gym. And then you go to the gym on Monday morning and you're like, oh, I don't want to be here. And the whole time you think about your boss that you hate and you're miserable (laughs) and all of these different things, then that routine is not rewarding. So it's not going to be a habit. Every time it comes time for Monday morning, that exact same program is going to keep going. You know, so coming from the perspective, if you set a goal, you know, enjoy yourself while you're doing it, get a pleasurable experience out of it. If you're going to eat food, eat food that you like, that you feel good about, you know, remind yourself that you feel good about it, all of these different things. So coming from the place of love for yourself, love for your body, I am nurturing myself. This is good for me. I want to be doing this. Don't say things like, you don't make friends with salad or, you know, (laughs) don't say things like that to yourself because it doesn't, it's not, about what is true and what is not true is what is true for what, how you feel. Yeah. Right. So I don't believe these ridiculous things. I, I don't believe that uh, unhealthy foods are fun. I don't believe that uh, celebrating requires me to eat junk food that harms my body. Like I don't have these beliefs. And so I don't feel bad when I don't get birthday cake because that, that doesn't exist in my paradigm. Yeah. So it's what you tell yourself over and over again. Um, so, when you are making these decisions to transform and you have laid out an action plan, choose an action plan that you're going to like. Okay. Not what your fr- worked for your friend and this person. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh man. Right. It doesn't <laughs> actually add a lot of stress to your life either. It's something that you can s- sustain and, 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 and do things slowly because if you do a overhaul, they're basically changing. You're trying to change a lot of subconscious programs eventually your willpower will fatigue because you're trying to do this consciously so do things slowly you know this instant gratification that we're all uh, so addicted to uh, is part of the reasons why we never get the goal in the in the end yeah yeah so well said casting votes for the person person you uh deserve to become and falling in love with the journey so that you can love that person in its entirety yeah yeah very cool. Very cool. Well, Maria Ain, so, so glad that you came on, um, Thank AKA nutritionist. Maria, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, greatly appreciate this is great. It. I really enjoyed this podcast. Yeah. I'm really, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, yeah yep, it always goes in some direction that, that I never expect. So that's always yeah, a beautiful. Me too. <laughs> great. Well, thank you again.